It was December 2006 and I left Rio. It was a burning hot, sunny Rio summer and I arrived in Colorado in the midst of a snowstorm, a very heavy one, so everything was white. I, I couldn't even see the, the, the airport. And for me, it was very new, very interesting and very moving as well because it was like it um, make, made the, the, the change of life even, even stronger, even more remarkable. And um, yeah, so it was, it was, it was very, it was very uh, new experience for me. It was actually the first time I ever saw snow in my life. And uh, Rio uh, has one of the world's most famous beaches, uh, Copacabana, and um, I used to go there as a as a kid and I used to take my son there too when he was a kid and I always wondered about what was there under the, the surf and under the, the, the water at the very bottom of the sea and it's, it's like a secret, it's a sort of, of a mysterious uh, kind of life that we don't really get to relate to, we don't interact with but that we know is there. Even though Colorado, even though Colorado is what it is today, uh, we know that it was under the ocean. And it's, it's, it's very curious for me to find this analogy between the place, the city where I grew up and that I had a, where I had a close relationship with the ocean and now that I live in a continental state, I, I don't have any contact with the ocean anymore. It's just mountains. But I know this used to be the ocean. So the mountains that I walk in, uh, on now, they, they could have been, they could have been uh, uh, under the sea. I left the horizon in peace and preferred to dream of islands which were real and which maybe I'd be able to swim to if I ever got serious about swimming and separated by a world of different shadows, a world where speed and sounds were different, where animals very different to myself lived, the world of fish, of algae, of mollusks, of crow blue shells like those I would read in a poem much later. A whole other life, other register, but a human being could actually swim between them, observe them, dive to the ocean floor in Copacabana and touch the intimacy of the sand there, so far from the popsicle sticks and volleyball and empada vendors. The intimacy that was completely oblivious to the chaos of the neighborhood of Copacabana where people hurried along or dawdled in the elderly gate of the retired or mugged or got mugged or queued at the bank or lifted weights at the gym or begged at traffic lights or pretended not to see people begging at traffic lights or looked at the pretty woman or were the pretty woman with the tiny triangles of her bikini top or tallied up prices on the supermarket cash register or collected garbage from the sidewalks and streets, or tossed garbage on the sidewalks and streets, or sold sex to tourists, or wrote poems, or walked their dogs. The drama of the city didn't even figure in the subconscious of the ocean floor. It was important or relevant. It didn't even exist there. I came to the United States twice before I came to live here. One was as a tourist to New York for a week with my first husband and the other was at a Buddhist monastery in California for two weeks and that was right after 9-11 uh, and I was so 
confused with all the security things going on. And um, I mean, in a way, I could understand it because it was it was shocking what happened. But I felt somewhat dis disrespected as well because it was the first time that I had to take my shoes off and, and you know and go through the whole security thing at the airport. And I thought, I, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm going back to this. I'm, I'm coming back to this country because this is this is way too much for me. This this obsession with uh, security, even though in a way it was I could understand it, but I didn't want to go through it again. And and then I meet this Brazilian guy in Rio who happens to live in 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 Denver. And uh, six months later, I'm in Denver uh, with my son. And, but it's not exactly Denver, it's Boulder. But it's, again, it's not exactly Boulder, it's Boulder County, but I live in a town called Louisville. So it's, it's, it's really like the Russian dolls that you, you know, you, you live one inside of the other and you just keep um, deconstructing. It was not planned at all, and I was... You, you should turn. Um, okay. Actually, you can turn on, on 28. I think it's better. Okay. Are you filming The Fly? Uh, there's an extraordinary book by Marguerite Duras, and she, she witnesses the death of a fly, and she's writing the, the book, it's, it's called Write, Écrire, and she's writing and, and there's this fly who is dying next to her and all the time she's witnessing the, the death of the fly, it's very beautiful, very poignant. I grew up part of my life in the city of Rio, in a neighborhood called Laranjeiras, where my parents still live. And the other part of the year, I would go to a small farm that belonged to my grandfather in the backlands of the state of Rio. So I had part of the year this very intense urban life in the big city of Rio, and part of the year I would, you know, walk barefoot and ride a horse and um, go to the rivers and, and, and climb the mountains and so on and so forth. So I, I think I have, because of that too, I have a very strong relationship with nature. And I think nature is very much present in almost everything that I write. My family, is an adorable family. Um, my parents, even though they were not particularly um, interested in, in literature more than anything else in life, they always supported me whenever I wanted to go to the bookstore and buy a book or two or three or five. And um, they were, when I started writing, I started writing very young. I was nine when I wrote my first poems and they were very proud of it and they liked to, to show the poems to, to everyone. And I remember my, my father taking my first short stories from when I was 10 or something to work, to show to, to people on his work. He used to work for the Banco do Brasil, the, the national bank in Brazil. I have two siblings, a brother and a sister, to whom I actually dedicated a book. They are more than siblings, they are very good friends. And it's a big family. I have a son, they have, we all together we have eight kids, and so my parents have eight uh, grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. And um, this is the tough thing about not living in Rio. I miss them a lot. I miss my family a great deal, but we, we get together every year. My father just turned 80 last December, but we get together every year. 
and they still haven't come to, to visit me here. I hope they will one day. And yeah, I miss them, but we're always missing something in life, I guess. I think we pretty much have to learn how to live with the things that we lack, the things that we really miss. And it's, it's okay, actually. It's, it's something that, it's a feeling that we can deal with, we can live with it. And in my case, I can, I can actually uh, turn it into literature when I write, uh, either when I write uh, fiction or poetry. Uh, all these life experiences are useful things, useful tools for, for writing. Fernando já tinha dado tantas voltas depois de sair de casa que já não lembrava mais qual o caminho. Claro, a casa já não estava mais lá, portanto o caminho não podia estar. E não é que a casa estivesse agora em toda parte, não. Isso é para os cidadãos do mundo, para os que viajam por esporte, para os que nunca se arrastaram sobre a lama congelada da China e nunca correram o risco de ser devorados pelos ursos no Alasca. Não é que a casa estivesse em toda parte. A casa não estava em parte alguma. The house I grew up in, in Rio, is a very special place and I still uh, go there every time that I visit Rio. Uh, it was a, actually a small two-story building uh, built by my grandfather to his two daughters. So my mom lives in the lower floor and my aunt on the top floor. And they are still there up to this day. It's been 50, 50 years. And, but it, what breaks my heart a little bit is that when my granddad built that house, he, he bought the land and he built it, um, it was a very bucolic sort of place in Rio. It was um, a dead-end street with cobblestones, and at the end of the street it was the forest, and there was this fountain. It was a very special place in, in Laranjeiras. And everything's changed around the house now. You know, the place is still the same, the building, the small building is still the same, but everything around it has changed so much. And there is so much noise and so many things going on, buses and, and loud music from the neighborhood. And sometimes I, 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 when I visit my parents, I feel that they are sort of hiding you know, it is as if their world, their small world, were still the same, but the exterior had changed a lot. And that's what happened actually with the city of Rio, because it grew so much in not that much time. So yeah, it's, for me, uh, because of that, it's not always easy to go uh, back there. There is this um, analogy that I like a lot about the river without not being able to to go to the same river two times. Actually we have the impression that the river is still the same but it's not because the water is changing all the time. And this is more or less what happens I think when we revisit places from our past. We have the impression that we will be able to find them again, but it will never be the same thing again. 
even if they apparently are, we change. So our eyes change and our relationship with these places change as well. So it's not, it's not really, in my opinion, it's not possible. Em agosto, passei a ir de vez em quando com o Fernando até a Biblioteca Pública Central de Denver, onde ele trabalhava como segurança. Andávamos um pouco, pegávamos o ônibus, andávamos mais um pouco até o quarteirão limitado pela Broadway, a Bannock Street e as avenidas 13 e 14. O Saab 1985 vermelho ficava em casa. Era caro estacioná-lo nos arredores da biblioteca. Uh, when I was um, 18, when my friends were going to, to college, I decided to go to France to, I don't know, to do something uh, different and to go away a little bit. Uh, there's a problem with Brazilian families. Act actually, most Latin American families are like that. They don't, they, they tend to stick together for longer than uh, it would be healthy to. So sometimes kids would stay with their parents until they are 30, 30 something. But it's, it was a very nice experience for me. It was the, the, my first contact with a different culture, with a different country, and with the other, you know, the, the unknown other person and I was friends with uh, many immigrants during that time and one thing that was very striking was that since I was a Brazilian immigrant I was considered cool but I had Arab friends, Arab immigrant friends that were not cool for the French. And they spent like $60,000 and all this Brazilian redwood, or Brazilian cherry, Brazilian cherry wood. Mm -hmm. All on the, the baseboards, all their doors, cabinets. Yeah. It was all. $60,000. Wow. wow. And that was considered cheap. Like, I guess cherry wood from other places is even harder to find, so they're just they're really taking it from that area. Yeah. And I was like, man, that's. Kind of sad to see it that happen, just so people can have a, a pretty house. Yeah, it is know? very sad, definitely. Yeah. First thing that comes to mind would be the rainforest. Um, I know there's a lot of slashing and clearing going on, making way for agricultural lands, and a lot of the uh, Brazilian redwood getting imported here to America that people are putting, you know, up as their doors and their trim and their cabinets and whatnot. Seems to be a little bit of a problem. Um, never been there personally. <laughs> so, um, one of my favorite bands happens to be from Sao Paulo, Brazil. They're named uh, Sepultura. I like them a lot. So, but yeah, you think of the jungle and the tropics and, and just. Amazing biodiversity. Yeah, uh, that's what comes to mind in Brazil. <laughs> well, first of all, I think that the character Vanja, she she finds this color, the the crow blue, that gives name to the book, as a way to relate her two places: the place where she comes from, Copacabana and the place where she's living now, um, Colorado. And it's a color that has to do with the natural wor world. So in Copacabana, they were, uh, there were the, the shells, the blue shells. And in Colorado, she discovers the, the, the crows and the ravens that are blue. Both worlds, uh, the world of the crow and the world of the, the shells, the, one, the, the yonder world of, of the sea in, in Copacabana, they're both in, in their own specific ways mysterious for her. Nowhere to go, no self to cherish or pity, 
no path to follow or fear, no oath, no aim, no breath, no other and no other miracle, no flaw, no truth. I think we live this life, or maybe I should say many times we waste this life with a lot of prejudice and a lot of concern about things such as the past and the future, and we very rarely are living in, in the present moment, in the here and the now. And Trying to do this, to live in, in what your life offers you in the moment, also uh, confronts you with the idea of to whom or to what you are relating to at that specific moment. And it's challenging to relate to others and to be respectful and not to want the others to be just like us. I mean, we are constantly looking for a mirror. And when we don't find the mirror, we tend to disregard and we tend to disrespect. And this can happen uh, with immigrants, for instance. And this can also happen uh, to the way we relate to other non-human animals. And it's a very uh, crucial thing for me. So speciesism, it, it has the same root as sexism and racism. So in the same way that uh, some time ago, a white man thought that they owned black men and that they could enslave them. In the same way that a while ago and even and in this present times, uh, men many times think that they own women. Uh, human beings think that they own animals. And this is a very serious ethical issue for me and something that has to be uh, reconsidered. And I think our evolution as, as a species, it will have to deal at some point very seriously with the issue of how we relate to other species, to the animal species. A dog barks outside. It is the coldest day of the coldest winter of our lives, mine and the dog's. In the midst of snow dragonflies, where is Buddha nature? What is Buddha nature? Does the dog really care? Can I start? Yes. Um, translation was never a problem for me as a writer. I know I write in Portuguese, uh, but even if I did uh, write in, in, in English or in Spanish, which are uh, languages that more people speak in the world, uh, I work as a translator as well and have done so for more than 10 years. So I'm used with working with other people's uh, books as well and make them available to the Brazilian reader. So I think this is natural. It's a natural process going from one language into other. And of course, it has to be done with care and, and, and attention and, and it, uh, the, the translator has to be very humble. Sometimes, of course, things are lost in translation, that's inevitable, but there is a degree of, of gain as well. Sometimes uh, I have books translated into 
into many languages and sometimes I think that when I'm able to read the translation of course uh, sometimes sometimes I find things better in in the translation than they were in the original and that's uh, that's amazing I mean that's um, that's how things are and it's it's way more organic than we tend to think it is um fenômeno curioso acontece quando você passa tempo demais longe de casa. A ideia do que seja essa casa, uma cidade, um país, vai desbotando como uma imagem colorida exposta diariamente ao sol. Mas você não adquire logo outra imagem para pôr no lugar. Tente, haja como, vista-se como, fale como as pessoas ao seu redor. Use as gírias, frequente os lugares mais frequentados, se esforce para compreender os espaços políticos. Tente não se surpreender a cada vez que vê as pessoas vendendo móveis e roupas e livros usados na garagem de casa. A placa, na esquina da rua, anuncia venda, garage sale. Ou os supermercados oferecendo toneladas de abóboras em outubro e ferramentas para esculpi-las, ou labirintos abertos nos milharais. Finja que nada disso é novidade. <música> 